much for joining us this morning. Uh, I'm Ben White with Plaid. Thanks for joining us for this morning's webinar, The State of Open Banking, What's New and What's Next for Open Banking in Canada. We're excited to have a truly esteemed set of guests join us for a wide ranging conversation about where we are in Canada as it relates to consumers' ability to access and share their own financial data in order to power their desired digital financial products and services. For those new to this area, you're in for a real treat. Open banking is an issue that's been on the minds of Canadian fintechs, regulators, and financial institutions for about the past five years and has slowly but surely been picking up steam. I don't think I'm alone when I say we're entering a significant moment for the future of fintech and open banking in Canada. The decisions that will be made by regulators over the next one or two or three years will determine the shape this ecosystem takes and how consumers and small to medium businesses benefit from it. But it's going to take a unified voice from everyone, especially us in the innovator part of the ecosystem to make sure consumers have the system that they need. Our goal for this webinar is to educate Plaid's customers and a wider market on what's going on in Canadian policymaking, why different parts of the financial and regulatory system feel so differently about the direction open banking might be going, and what we can do as an industry to set ourselves and our customers up for success in the coming years. Before we jump in, just a few housekeeping items. I think it's safe to say by now, everyone's pretty familiar with the Zoom platform, but please feel free at any time to jump into the chat or the Q&A if you have specific questions for our panelists. We'll do a Q&A at the end of the session today. And also this session will be recorded. So if you or your colleagues have to miss any second of our riveting conversation, we will send it around to attendees afterwards. So to get started, a couple of introductions and I'll just go around the horn here. Vas Bednar is a public policy entrepreneur working at the intersection of technology and public policy. She is an interdisciplinary wonk focused on ensuring that we have the regulatory structures we need to embrace the future of work and new ways of living. As an enthusiastic and perpetual student of the policymaking process, she has held leadership roles at Delphia, Airbnb, Queen's Park, the City of Toronto, and the University of Toronto. Vass is a creative data-driven thinker and was the chair of the federal government's expert panel on youth employment. A graduate of McMaster University's arts and science program, Vass holds the Masters of Public Policy from the University of Toronto and successfully completed Action Canada and Civic Action Diversity Fellowships. Passionate about public dialogue, she was also the co-host of Detangled, a weekly pop culture and public policy radio show and podcast that ran from 2016 to 2018. She now writes a newsletter about Canadian startups and public policy called Regs to Riches. Alex Ronsis is the Executive Director of Paytex of Canada, representing a diverse community of payment technology companies operating in Canada. Using his payments and policy knowledge and network, Alex leads the push for a more competitive and innovative Canadian payments ecosystem. Hannah Zaidi wears many hats in our world. Her day job is the Chief Compliance Officer for Payments at Wealthsimple, one of Canadian's largest fintech companies, where she helps the team navigate regulated spaces and develop new products to serve Canadian customers. Hannah also sits on the board of Open Banking Initiative Canada, an advocacy group dedicated to bringing about an open banking structure in Canada. She's an advisor, investor, and operator in the fintech space, and has a keen eye for how changing regulation affects business. Welcome everyone. Um, since this is a Plaid event, I'm going to play a bit of a double role of both moderator and panelist. So while I'll ask questions directed at panelists, if you don't mind, I will also graciously and judiciously jump in where I think Plaid has a unique perspective to offer. So you can see on the panel, we have an operator, a former regulator and a current policy advocate, lots to explore together. So let's dive right in with Hannah. Could you please give us a, a bit of a recent history on what's been going on with open banking in Canada? In the last few months in particular, we've seen an advisory committee report and the re-election of a minority government. Uh, if you wouldn't mind just helping us out sort of setting the context here for this conversation. 
Yeah, for sure. It's one of those questions where a lot has happened and nothing has happened at the same time, but maybe just a level set quickly for, for the audience. Quick recap of timelines in 2018, the Open Bank Committee was established. The purpose was to provide Canadians with more control over their financial information, getting them access to better rates and innovative products. They then had a two-phased uh, stakeholder consultation process with a wide range of participants, including banks, credit unions, fintechs, aggregators, consumer advocacy groups. And then the second phase was held um, in fall 2020. Then finally, in, in August 2021, um, for a variety of reasons as to why that delay happened, the committee uh, released the recommendations report. And so sort of now current state, uh, the report concluded that, you know, they're recommending a speedy implementation of an open banking system, urging the government to take an immediate step by appointing an open banking lead. And if the, report, the, the recommendations in the report are heated, open banking could arrive as soon as January, 2023. Um, so the liberals in the last election, like you mentioned, Ben, they committed-ish to open banking. Um, and, uh, you know, it's what it surprisingly became an election issue. And so actually last week at the Open Banking Expo, the former finance minister um, stated that he believes in an industry-led approach as opposed to a government-mandated uh, one as, as proposed by the uh, advisory committee. So obviously taking the former finance minister's position with a grain of salt, he was forced to resign. But one thing is clear to me, at least, that we need to get really clear on what exactly the current uh, you know, government plans to do and, and timelines and sort of the commitment. It needs to be re-endorsed by the, the current Minister of Finance. We're already at the end of 2021. There's been a few names thrown around on how, you know, who the lead might be, but nothing concrete yet. January 23 is fast approaching. So we definitely need to get on, you know, doing something sooner rather than later. Thanks, Hannah. That's that's really great overview. And I, I feel like every time we have one of these discussions, we get snappier and snappier at that really extensive timeline where you said a lot has happened uh, and really built out this pretty robust set of recommendations. So, Alex, you've, you've written a little bit about these recommendations and from where you sit, representing a pretty broad range of industry stakeholders. What were some of the key takeaways for you from the recommendations? Uh, and in particular, given that they're there could be an appointment of an open banking lead soon. What do you think fintech companies in particular need to know about this system as it was proposed? Sure. Um, thanks, Ben. So as far as the advisory committee's report goes and the recommendations, I think there are two big issues. One is that the advisory committee hasn't actually recommended that the government really do anything about open banking until after 2023, other than appoint a lead, uh, as Hannah said, and use its moral suasion to nudge the industry to coalesce around a voluntary data sharing arrangement. This has already made, so to sum that up really crudely, I would just say the, the, the first phase of the advisory committee's report is really market-driven open banking under the supervision of the government. Uh, this has already made for a public policy vacuum that is being dominated by the biggest banks in the country. Uh, we've seen how ineffective a legislated mandate uh, can be to counteract the power of Canada's biggest banks in the context of payments modernization. So it's not hard to imagine how difficult, how much more difficult it's going to be to counteract the dominance of Canada's biggest banks in what is effectively a public policy vacuum. The, the advisory committee made the recommendation knowing that it would take the government a while to get its act together and move on open banking. And so it was seen that by appointing a person and, and having them manage a process, they could get to market faster. But that, but that approach is not w without its own set of challenges. The other issue is just that the advisory committee and the government is neglecting right access, which a lot of fintechs in Canada see as being crucial to promoting competition um, and crucial to fixing what is a very dysfunctional payment system in Canada. In 2018 and 2019, that neglect made a lot of sense. Uh, payments modernization was really just beginning. We we're trying to figure out whether a lot of the stuff that was being promised would even happen. 
In 2021, that neglect doesn't make as much sense. Uh, we know we're going to get new federal payments re regulation. We know there are new payment systems on the way. Uh, right access and, and payment initiation in particular needs to enter the conversation. We, we can't continue to be intellectually lazy about this. Thanks, Alex. That, that's really useful. Vass, I'm seeing you've been a couple of questions in the chat here, a little bit of, of interest in sort of taking things to a, a bit of a higher level. So given your, your background and, and your, your sort of perspective, looking more broadly across competition and innovation uh, in Canada, can you share with us a little bit just how open banking fits into that overall context? Um, and then, you know, sort of your take on on what open banking itself uh, is, how it how it functions, and I think you know myself, Alex, and and Hannah can provide our own uh, definitions of that as well. You got it. I'll try my best. It's like speaking of intellectually lazy. Over to Vast. Just kidding. So uh, a main area of, of research for me, I, I I spend a lot of time thinking about public policy and technology, as you heard in, in my beautiful and, and far too long intro, but thank you for it. Um, last year, I want to say last year was earlier this year, April, what is time? My research collaborator and I, Robin Chabon, published a paper with Miguel on the state of competition in Canada, state of competition policy. Um, if you control F that report and look for open banking or fintech stuff, you're not going to find a lot, but it's certainly part of that conversation. It's part of that conversation insofar as, you know, taking this macro approach and starting an wanting to understand, you know, Canada as a country, Canada's attitudes to policy change, and also a lot of the policy inertia that we see. We heard from Hannah, um, you know, yes, there's been progress, uh, everything and nothing lately on this file. So, you know, what we see in Canada from a legislative perspective, with our core kind of attitudes towards competition, generally not exclude, you know, excluding uh, the banking act and the banking sector is that we are uh, very traditional, very uh, small C conservative, and you know we have a lot of faith in our existing legislative regimes. And, and something that I think is challenging for policymakers overall is when they're making strides towards something like this, towards something like open banking, um, it's very difficult to feel confident about how people are moving forward, right? Because public policy so often has to be big, or it feels big, or it feels like it's forever, but it doesn't need to be that way, right? We can be running a pilot, we can be demonstrating, we can have a regulatory sandbox for open banking. I think for a consumer perspective, and I'm sorry if I'm taking too long on this answer, from a consumer perspective, I think we might see that actually, you know, there, or we should be demonstrating that people actually, uh, certain let me start again, that certain environments actually have open banking like ecosystems, they're just closed gardens, right? So if you want to start talking about, and we should actually do a go around with the other panelists on what is open banking, why is it a game changer, not just for fintechs, but most of all for people, um, I think there's a really big blind spot for consumers. And that's why we don't have uh, consumer advocacy groups as well, kind of, you know, pushing forward on this file. So I'll just close by saying maybe the strongest connection policy wise, and I know we'll touch on this a little bit later, is with uh, proposed previously proposed privacy and consumer protection legislation in Canada that did have a data portability framework. I actually think that's really smart, right? Advocating for data portability is a bigger conversation than just open banking, but in terms of empowering everyday people to port information that they have uh, freely at their own discretion, you know, it's long overdue. And as Richard's saying, huge blind spots for consumers like Australia, maybe we'll dig into that more too. Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts that um, Ben, if it's okay, I just want to add as well. Um, I do agree that it is important to level set what the definition of open banking is. And I think everybody kind of has a different take on, on what it is. My definition is, you know, the consumer then has control over how, you know, their financial data and who and how to share it with. Um, and when. So meaning that they can revoke access at any time, they can direct it to whoever they want, you know, that's within the eco, the, the open banking ecosystem. I think that's a really important definition, because if you think about it, how is that in effect in, a, in the current state market led um, system, right? Um, in, in the current system, you as the consumer don't own your data. And there's laws and, and terms and conditions that state they don't. 
Um, so if we go with that definition, then it currently doesn't exist. I think the other piece of it is that I'm glad we're talking about competition when it comes to open banking, because it is a competition issue. But the other flip side of it is consumers don't feel that way in Canada. Um, I think that's a big pain point. It's, it's fintechs and, you know, a lot of the people on this call that feel sort of, you know, the pressure of the other side of, of not having a level playing field. But at the end of the day, I think the hard fact that we have to sort of think about is that consumers have a lot of trust in Canadian banks and our financial system and don't see that there is an issue and don't really know what they're missing either. So I think that I've said this in another forum, but I think that rather than us focusing on competition as an issue publicly to get people to care about open banking, we should rather have a different intent around, you know, like a social issue. Maybe it's open banking as a tool to get better uh, retirement outcomes for people. Um, competition is an issue, but it's not an issue that people care about. That's totally fair. Not a lot of people care about competition, but it's the reason we're not going to get open banking in Canada in 2022 20, and 2023. Yeah. Sorry. Right. Like, and I think it'd be useful and I'm not the moderator. So sorry, Ben, you might kick me out of the zoom, but I think it could be useful. Alex, you're probably ready with your own definition, but to put a placeholder or put a pin in the, yeah, talking more about what it means for Canadians and how we get people more excited about what it means. Cause those two words together, I think are still fairly meaningless for so many people. Right. Agree. Yeah. I mean, I think what we're getting at and Alex, I'll certainly let you jump in in just a second, but, but maybe just to pull back just a tiny bit. Right. I think part of the objective of us hosting this webinar in the first place is that there's a clear need, I think both from policymakers who plan and I'm sure the, the rest of my panelists here speak to on a regular, regular, relatively frequent basis, quite often come back with this very same question, which is how does this matter to my constituents? And I think what we can really get at collectively as an ecosystem, and what I mean when I say ecosystem is not just the FinTech part of the world here, right? This is something that matters, I think just as much uh, or should matter just as much, especially if you pull back into that context of rights related to consumers and their data to financial institutions, and even to other parts of the system as well. So we, you know, we've seen open banking in some cases in Canada viewed almost as a beachhead issue for broader data portability rights. I think, again, we'll save that maybe for a little bit later on in the conversation with regards to specifics and how that might move forward. Um, but I'm really glad just to, to point out that we're having this conversation right now, which is to say, perhaps the most powerful thing that we can all do together as an ecosystem is to get really crisp around the consumer benefit of a data right. And Hannah, you've done a tremendous job in this context and in others, pulling it down to that individual level and saying, this is how this benefits uh, each and every one of us. Um, Alex, I think you know the reason I wanted to sort of interject here and get over to you is that you have a, a pretty amazing sort of bird's eye view of the development of different use cases. And so I'm curious from your perspective as you know, the representative of, of a pretty broad swath of, of industry actors, you know, what are you seeing in terms of uh, real traction that, that some of your membership has seen because they're simply solving problems for consumers? And how can you see us leveling that up into this broader ecosystem narrative of why open banking is ultimately to the benefit of consumers and small businesses. So the, there's a wide range of use cases, but they often come down to a few few themes. Like when I think about data portability in the context of financial services, you know, it, it allows lenders to come up with different ways to assess risk and and help uh, uh, increase loans and access to capital for small and medium sized businesses. On the payment side, we see the major credit card net networks viewing um, open banking payments as a competitive threat and making acquisitions on that basis. They are betting on disruption. They're betting on cheaper and better payments. Um, I think the fintech ecosystem could definitely do a better job telling these stories, but I don't think we should totally neglect some of the more technocratic arguments in favor of these things, such as competition. Different audiences um, 
we, we need to capture the hearts and minds of different audiences in the ecosystem. There, there, there are definitely parts of the ecosystem that want to hear more about uh, you know, how this helps say financial inclusion or how, how this helps small and medium-sized businesses build back better. But I think in some parts of the government, there is a healthy skepticism uh, that you know, open banking will make the financial sector more competitive writ large. There are people who don't think the financial sector is um, lacking a lot of competition. There are a lot of banks by conventional measures of competition. Canada doesn't score poorly compared to some of its peer jurisdictions. Um, and if I'm, you know, a uh, impartial civil servant advising up, uh, if I don't see the data that says this is a problem that needs to solve, uh, that needs to be solved, um, the person making the decision isn't going, it, it is going to be short one more reason uh, that could help. When I think about payments modernization, which is an initiative that a lot of fintechs care about on a separate track, it is not politically popular at all. People have barely paid attention to it, and yet it's chugged along uh, because there's been a more technocratic push to get it done because it actually solves real problems. The government has decided that, you know, though the average Canadian, though the median voter doesn't even know what a payment system is, they need a better one. Uh, and we've seen what's happened in other jurisdictions when you've modernized the systems and you've broadened access to them. Uh, they've decided, and, and I've been convinced uh, that Canada could see those benefits too. So, I'm not saying we should neglect one story uh, over the other or tell one at the expense of the other, but I do think we need um, to tell all the stories to all the different audiences. Otherwise, this is not going to move. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point, Alex. Maybe what I'll try to, to bring forward a little bit here is, is just the state of play as it currently exists, right? So we've laid out this context in which open banking is a policy issue that matters you know, to a certain audience, obviously we have uh, representatives, you know, like Senator Deacon, who's been a real champion for some time. It is an issue when the advisory committee report was published that finance minister Freeland welcomed the report, didn't quite add much more momentum beyond that. Although with the policy platforms mentioning it, you know, to be seen how much more attention and interest this gets from finance. In terms of practicalities and what the ecosystem actually looks like functionally today, this gets back to the question of what open banking is. Right? In order for data to be portable, really what we're talking about is a policy framework in service of a technical system. The technical system is about how, in fact, that data is made portable and who can conduct what sort of operations on that data. I think this is what the advisory committee report really aimed at, was to provide at least a high level framework and a vision for how they would want such a system to take hold. Again, really starting in 2023 and up until that point, having um, some real guardrails or at least some measures against which to evaluate the progress. So when we talk about industry driven or regulation driven, ultimately what that comes down to is who is in charge of building that infrastructure and on what terms. Today, because Canadian consumers do not have a legally binding data right, for example, like we do have in the United States under Section 1033 of Dodd-Frank, or European um, and British consumers have under the Second Payment Services Directive, a lot of the infrastructure that currently exists is a, a little bit you know, interim, you could say. There's a pretty broad acknowledgement across open banking globally that the technical infrastructure of application programming interfaces, which is this software tool that allows systems to speak to one another and data to flow in accordance to a consumer's authorizations is the way of the future. Um, it is yet to be seen how that sort of infrastructure takes hold in Canada. But ultimately what I think Plaid is an advocate for and truly our I think, you know, in some sense, trying to be unbiased read of the advisory committee report is that by establishing some sort of data right to data portability, a consumer right uh, to access and share one's data, that the technical infrastructure that would be built on top of that would be in service of that ultimate consumer right. So the reason I'm bringing that forward a little bit is 
I think it helps lay out some of the context on what today's world looks like versus that future world. Today's world is one in which because that dedicated infrastructure is in this sort of TBD, where will it land mode, a consumer's right to access and move their data and the technical functionality that comes as a result of that is largely in the hands of the holders of the data today. Um, and that's what happens when a consumer tries to log into an application and that connection doesn't work, right? That's because the technical infrastructure grounded in that consumer right hasn't been fully realized. So I wanna sort of lay that foundation and then maybe take us over back into policy land a little bit. And, and you know, Alex, you mentioned payments modernization. Vast, you touched a little bit on uh, privacy developments. I wonder if Vass, I can, I can point to you for a moment and get your sort of high level, what's the state of play around privacy currently in Canada? Because hopefully from my description just now, it's a little bit clearer that by establishing a foundation of a privacy right that includes, I like to think of it as sort of positive and negative rights to privacy. Positive is I get to tell companies what I want them to do with my data or who that data should go to. Negative being revoke that access to data, what you can and can't do with it. Obviously, these are pretty high level concepts that we've seen rolled out in other jurisdictions. What's what's going on in Canada right now with regards to privacy and, and why is that important for us here? I mean, I don't want to depress anyone. Nothing's going on right now. We had we had a, a proposed bill last year that I mentioned. I, I think the privacy conversation is is has fallen victim to kind of a, a classic uh, challenge right now we have in Canada with our policymaking, which I'm sure you see in other jurisdictions which is that we're very anxious about the potential of a regulatory intervention to inhibit this thing we call innovation, right? So this was a groundbreaking piece of legislation in Canada because it was very explicit about, you know, there might be some set of, of permissible consumer interests for data. So what we were trying to do in Canada was have a conversation about our information, how it's used in this digital context, the lack of agency that people have. I mean, we're calling them consumers, right? Everyday people, citizens have with their information and that's where portability came up. So on the topic of portability, it was well received, but let's not forget that's a lot of work for an individual person. The way we see portability playing out, for instance, in California with the CCPA, you know, you're going and filling out a lot of forms or maybe using an AI or a bot that someone made to, to request information that people have on you, but it's more illuminating than anything else. We don't know that that information is unlocking anything. So, you know, when you say privacy and you asked me to reflect on that, a place my mind's been going in my notes is also, uh, and back to the telling, telling these good stories so that people understand and appreciate this file a little bit more, I'd love to help do more in Canada to have people understand what are banks doing with my data now, right? Back to what is already happening. Because sometimes when we present, uh, I think, you know, anecdotally, when we present open banking as something that unlocks these new opportunities and unlocks these opportunities for more players and, and for more people. And again, agency and choice are important words we've been touching on, but I don't think people appreciate how you know, insights derived from the data they volunteer to their banks or banks uh, integrated with data that banks may also be purchasing, et cetera, is already being used to further enrich banks and to make particular recommendations to customers. So I'd love to see more transparency and more stories in that regard too. I don't know if anyone who's here has a story in, in the chat that they want to drop on. Um, but I think that kind of storytelling can really mobilize people. And I'll just round out by saying another curious function of the policy process in Canada is we rely so much on political pressure from the public, right? Demand. I call it the Spice Girls model of public policy. Tell me what you want, what you really, really want. Well, sometimes things are just good ideas or the right idea or the right time. And we have expertise and we're in line with other jurisdictions and it's time to do something. So if we are going to need, I mean, the Spice Girls are always helpful, but if we're going to need overwhelming consumer demand and, and public pressure in order to finally achieve open banking, that's not how we're going to get it in Canada. And that shouldn't be the way we need to get it. Uh, because in so many ways, I think it's absolutely 
uh, a no brainer. And it comes down to some of the technicalities that I know you guys are more savvy when it comes to debating the, the how, not the what. Alex or Bass, any, any reflections on, sorry, Alex or Hannah, any, any reflections on Bass's point there? I have some thoughts, but I definitely want to pass it to you. Nothing, nothing from the Spice Girls reference. That wasn't useful. I was just going to say, I, I really love the Spice Girls reference. Or, I have nothing to add to that. Okay, let it stand on its own. Okay, one more thing. You know, <laughs> yes, the banks are riding high from the 2008 financial crisis. Who isn't? By the way, who wouldn't want to go back to 2008 just for a second? Some of the time, no one. But um, there are things that the banks do that aren't necessarily awesome for Canada, Right. It was a bank decision when when the mortgage the mortgage deferral. You think back to that very first bit of this very long pandemic. The mortgage deferral is a policy design. I think is a terrible policy design. Why were banks charging interest when the mortgage was paused? That was not a public policy decision. That was a bank decision. Did that help or hurt people? You could not calculate. I tried to make my own mortgage. I was not deferring my mortgage, but. I was trying to make my own mortgage deferral calculator. It was a complex calculation. I don't think consumers had a lot of transparency into what they were agreeing to. And I think it was, you could argue was banks taking advantage of some uncertainty. So that's housing, that's housing in a different kind of emergency context. And I think people were hard done by. You're like, Vass, please make it about open banking. I'll just also say that it's a shame that in Canada, uh, no fintechs were able to administer pandemic benefits to people, right? We know people bank in all kinds of ways. That's another way I think banks have been deficient and aren't serving Canada's best interest, but we still don't do a great job telling those stories. Why not? Yeah, I, I agree. You know, if you uh, talk to some business associations, uh, they'll tell you candidly that they're not totally sure what to make of open banking. They're not sure whether it will benefit um, uh, their constituents. If you talk to the median voter about open banking, they won't ask you about open banking. They'll probably ask you what a fintech is. So I almost wonder sometimes whether, you know, instead of talking about the benefits of open banking, uh, we need to talk about the benefits of innovation in financial services in general. Uh, because for most people, uh, one of the big big banks is all they know. That's that's their conception of what the financial sector in Canada is and will be for uh, years and years to come. Ben, can I say one more thing? Go it's for not it. related to Serb, sorry, or the Spice Girls. Um, hang on, I lost it in my mind related to open banking. Oh, I think we also are failing to tell a story about why open banking could be amazing for policymakers too. I think back in 2018, if you guys really want to go back to like a fun year pre-pandemic, uh, when Stats Canada kind of got, got their wrist slapped for approaching some banks, right? They were trying to replace uh, an old household survey on, on everyday spending where people, they mailed them a pencil and a notebook. Their data was terrible. It was expensive for taxpayers. It took a long time. And instead, they approached some banks and entered into an agreement where they could share aggregated anonymized information, but have a better picture of everyday spending. I feel like that could be retold through an open banking lens in a really interesting way where instead, you know, people are, are consulted and have agency and are saying, yes, I, you know, trust Statistics Canada and want to share some of my banking information so that I can inform better public policy or better consumer price index. That's amazing for Canada, but I don't know, that would get me excited. Yeah, no, I think that's a really excellent point. As someone who worked as an economist in a past life, the lack of data and data sets to actually inform recommendations and policy making is incredibly scarce. And my guess is the economists at Stats Canada are just trying to get creative with how they get access to this information. And I completely agree that that is a public policy story that we could tell and, and inform better decision making around spending behavior and a bunch of things that we don't even know because we don't have access to that data. So uh, these are all really fascinating points and I'm glad we're spending so much time talking about really the benefits because that's that's what's gonna ultimately you know win win the debate here. Uh, to, to take us back to brass tax just a little bit, you know, we talked about the advisory committee recommendations, which are are you know, quite robust and, and I think fairly comprehensive in terms of the, the framework that they lay out. One element that I uh, would love to hear from our panel on, in, in particular, Hannah and Alex, 
um, is the, this concept of accreditation. Just to give some context, uh, and I saw we had a question as well about how the advisory committee in Canada has looked at other jurisdictions for um, some learnings and some influence. The, the United Kingdom, which is looked at as sort of the flagship example of a regulatory driven approach to open banking, where you know they built this system on top of PSD2, which established consumers' rights to access their payment data and said, we actually, from a competition standpoint, uh, need more competition in our financial services market. And so we're going to create an ecosystem by which third party providers can gain access with consumer's permission and consent to consumer data and perform some operations on that data, products and services that they would like to offer um, without necessarily having a formal relationship with a financial institution. And the way that they did that was by saying, here's this accreditation system, you know, license yourself uh, with the government, with the overseeing body over open banking, and that's really, you know, that's all you need in order to gain access to the system. I don't say all you need in that it's nothing, but the, the idea behind it is that rather than relying on sort of bilateral negotiations and agreements across third parties and the holders of the data, make a requirement for everyone to sort of up-level themselves, you could say, in terms of licensing and accreditation in order to, to offer services in this system. So without asking you to get, you know, too expert on the, on the UK model, um, what do you both see as sort of the the upsides and maybe some some downsides too of putting forward this accreditation model and and what in particular should fintech companies be thinking about given that if we do get this open banking lead in the next couple of months we could see some consultations on accreditation where it's going to be you know fintechs are going to need to be at the table saying here's what we would like to see out of this system and here's what we can offer um, and really manage you know a lot of these companies are are not as big as the wealth simples of the world and are just trying to sort of break into the market and in that sense you know there might be some risks to accreditation so without answering the question myself uh hannah <laughs> alex would love to hear your thoughts on on pluses minuses of an accreditation model yeah i i, I can definitely go first i think you hit the nail on the head around it being commensurate to size and so maybe to, to provide a bit of context for those um, who, who didn't get a chance to attend the consultations on open banking. During phase two of the consultations, the FinTechs actually pushed for an accredited process that would be decentralized from the government, uh, but would have a clear set of criteria that would be inclusive to all sizes of business, industry participants, like FinTechs, small, medium-sized businesses, credit unions, et cetera. And so the reason for this is because, um, you know, what, what would it mean if the government was responsible for reviewing and carrying out the accredited process for every single entity that would become a part, want to become a participant? It would be, the fees would be, you know, cost prohibitively high. The process would be highly inefficient and lengthy. So we push for a decentralized model, very similar to a SOC accreditation process where big auditing firms can provide these services so long as they have the actual criteria that they can evaluate for. So the hope was that, you know, it would keep the costs low, more accessible, the process would be more efficient. And the good part is the advisory committee listened to this, included it as part of their um, proposal, and they described that the accreditation criteria at a super high level would be things like it needs to be a trusted process, you need to be able to demonstrate credibility in the ecosystem, it needs to be done independently by a third party, the, the process should be proportional to the risk, which again is like I think really, really key to making sure it's accessible to all players and, you know, like you said, it shouldn't, the same process that Walt Simple is subject to or a credit union should not be the same process that like a five to 10 person FinTech is, you know, looking to get access to the system should be. So, and the process should be transparent and public and the, and, and the public should know the criteria. So I think these are good principles to build an accreditation model on top of, but like you said, the devil is in the details and how the execution of what this is gonna look like. And I think my biggest concern is just to make sure that this is something that is actually going to be accessible to all players. Yeah, I, I think that's that's super important. And the context you provided on how this concept came forward 
in the consultations, I think is a really important one because, you know, in the background, I think of a lot of what we've talked about today is this sense, which I think is in some cases too much pervaded the dialogue around open banking in Canada, which is this push and pull between incumbent and new entrant. And, you know, for those who weren't able to attend the open banking expo last week, I think we heard a lot from financial institutions, and I, I won't try to speak on their behalf, but around this idea of building broader industry consensus. And something that I find promising about an accreditation model is that, well, two things really. The first is that thinking back even to last year and the exclusion of fintechs from COVID stimulus uh, participation, I've heard from uh, several folks in Canada that part of the justification for that is that there's a lack of oversight over some of these parties. And an accreditation system under open banking, I think, could be a really adequate and great sort of on-ramp and really seal of approval that would elevate the status of a lot of these fintechs uh, in the eyes of, of other parts of the regulatory system, not just financial regulators, but folks who are making these decisions on who gets to participate in which parts of the system. So it, I think it can carry some positive benefits for fintech beyond just um, the, the currently existing model of, of open banking. Uh, the second piece in my mind is that uh, it, it is deliberately flexible, right? It's meant to be open and accommodative to changes in the ecosystem. Alex, you've mentioned payments modernization a couple of times. Um, you know, given that that's an example that, that you mentioned has really chugged along even without having the same level of policy um, desirability, you could say, you know, what what other lessons do you think there are from payments modernization and, and additionally opportunities? I think we know the real-time rail might be coming. There was this mention of right access and in particular payment initiation service um, as part of phase two of open banking. You know, when we think about, you know, getting access to these systems, you know, bringing together a, a sense of open banking, which I think works well in Canada, which is not just, hey, let's introduce this new entrance for competition, for innovation in opposition to what the banks are currently doing, but how do we level up this entire ecosystem in order to take advantage and to benefit consumers of infrastructure developments like the real-time rail? So, a bit of a winding question, but to Alex, I'm curious, like what other opportunities does real-time rail open up and where might we use more tightly together? Right. So uh, before I answer those two questions, uh, I, I just want to say one thing. I think payments modernization has actually had more policy desirability than, than something like open banking. I think that's why we're a lot further ahead. Um, in that conversation than we are in open banking. That said, the payments modernization conversation has been happening for over a decade. Um, the world has literally changed in so many ways to make it desirable from a policy perspective. Uh, we have new risk-proof payment systems on the way. We have federal payments regulation. We wanted to change one little thing about the world, which is access to payment systems, but we've had to change the world around it to get people to buy in. Um, no one I've seen speaking in a public setting has dismissed the idea that that fintech should have access to payment systems although i do still encounter arguments from certain stakeholders in the ecosystem that um open banking uh, sh shouldn't happen by the hand of government it should be an industry consensus um i think more work needs to be done to build that policy desirability and i think things like accreditation would certainly help it would help level up uh, the fintechs, as you said, and, and help build trust in the system. Um, I think for too long, and I'll, I'll, I'll tie it into your question here. I think for too long, we've neglected this right access question. There are so many complementarities between what's happening on payments modernization and open banking. The, the line in 2018 and 2019 was whatever the government does on right access will be staged and aligned with payments modernization. Um, if you want a sense of the progress we've made there, the line on this very thing in the advisory committee's report was whatever the government does on right access will be staged and aligned with payments modernization. We've made absolutely no progress on that question. 
And there, there is a risk of things like duplication. For example, you know, uh, uh, fintechs in payments will have to demonstrate compliance with the Retail Payment Activities Act. They'll have to have standards in place to manage all sorts of operational risks, all sorts of risks that come with the movement of money. Um, these are the these are the sorts of requirements that one would theoretically have to meet to be able to move money in an open banking ecosystem. And I'm not convinced uh, that that policymakers and industry um, have connected the dots sufficiently to begin this conversation. Uh, and I worry that the longer we continue to be intellectually lazy on this, um, the more likely we'll miss the opportunity and we'll have built something uh, with an unintended consequence that we'll have to look at and do all over again. Thanks, Alex. Um, I, I think on your point of you know, the education that's needed and, and not just from a consumer perspective, but from a policymaker perspective as well. Um, I understand that, that you and, and VAS are starting some collaboration around research. I don't know if now is an opportune moment for, for you to share a little bit about what that would entail, but I do think we probably have some folks in the audience here that might be interested in either participating or contributing. So. Um, is there anything you can share about some of your efforts and, and potentially joint efforts and collaborative efforts that we can participate in to, to try to move this education forward? Vast, do you want to talk about it? Sure, I'm just eating a fisherman's friend, sorry everyone. Um, yeah, we've just started a research project looking at banking and competition in Canada. So I know Hannah's going to find it really boring. I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm still going to send you a copy and talk to you about it, Hannah. Um, and we're taking a quantitative and a qualitative approach. So alongside uh, different data-driven indicators and kind of maybe building a, a new comparative indice since some of the numbers that we have to evaluate uh, competition in banking may not be satisfying or, or communicate enough. We're also doing a series of interviews and just talking about learning and talking about the industry behaviors, norms, and attitudes so that we can speak more comprehensively about the system that we that we have in Canada and what the what the environment is like and what it means for people to try to innovate and and do something new. So feel free to get in touch with us or with Alex or with Hannah too, or with Ben and he'll he'll uh, forward it over to us. I hope that was an okay plug. I know I'm not like revealing too no, much great. early days. No, it's always it's always excellent to host a webinar and have such a an actionable you know to do you know reach out to us get involved this is a, a great to moment to, to hear yeah. hear from everybody i do uh want to get to some of the questions in the chat um a couple of them that i've seen so far largely revolve around lessons learned from other jurisdictions um or sort of blueprints that we can follow uh, I guess to take a first crack at that, and then I think Hannah, given your participation in the consultations, can probably chime in as well. Um, I actually think the advisory committee was pretty explicit about how much they have taken away um, from, from other jurisdictions, and particularly where they landed on this hybrid made in Canada approach is this concept that you know Canadian, Canadian banking is a very unique uh, ecosystem in terms of its composition and makeup and, and who participates um, and adopting, you know, uh, exactly one for one, uh, an, an ecosystem that has maybe found success elsewhere, you know, it's probably better to sort of take off small chunks that have that have worked uh, specifically to the types of structures that we currently see in Canada. Um, so Hannah, is there maybe one or two examples you can think of um, or even just one, because that's probably sufficient, of, of a, a lesson that you saw incorporated into the advisory committee recommendations from another jurisdiction? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think, I think one of the things that, you know, we've been pushing for is that, um, you know, looking at other jurisdictions like the UK, like Australia, you know, they've done some things really well and they've done some things not well, particularly in the UK where, um, you know, you have a million uh, different APIs to plug into. It's like a bespoke system. I mean, you guys live through this yourselves at Plaid. Every, every financial institution has their own API. So then you have aggregators that essentially have to build that bridge between. And so there has been a lower adoption of open banking uh, than expected, um, you know, as a result of that. So I think that 
there is a bit of an understanding that there needs to be some form of standard. I think the question is how that standard is going to be developed and what the process is going to look like. So I think that's a sentiment that most people share and, and that, that has been a learning of maybe what not to do. But again, like that, that remains to be seen. Um, Excellent. Yeah, I, I think you, you know, we pointed earlier to the accreditation model as something that was conceivably ported over from the UK. Um, and, and the idea of standardization is, is a big one as well, especially as we see FDX now in Canada and the CIO Strategy Council is releasing an open banking standard. So lots to learn about specifically on the data access front um, as, as these systems take shape. Um, I think that covers most of the questions. If, if anyone in the audience has additional questions that they'd like to drop either into the chat or the Q&A, uh, we're happy to get to those before I do one last round of, of questions to our panelists, which uh, inspired by Vass's earlier Spice Girls reference is uh, if any of us have a favorite open banking related uh, tune that we can think of off of the top of our heads. Uh, I'll give folks a couple minutes to think through that as we answer uh, Richard's question, which is, how do we foresee the actual fintech banks partnerships where you don't have a regulation that allows data portability? Um, is that not a two level playground? Um, just making sure I entirely grasp the question. I mean, I think the idea is essentially, given that one of these parties will be the primary holder of the data and, and another sort of needing to rely on that primary party as uh, sort of unlocking access to that data, you know, what, what could that look like? I think that's, you know, maybe to, to circle back to the very start of this conversation, like without a regulation allowing data portability, this is sort of the state of play today, right? The, the rights and the abilities that consumers have to access and share their data are largely dependent on uh, the whims and, and determinations of, uh, of the data holders. I think a really important concept to take away also from the advisory committee recommendations is the concept of data reciprocity, which is something that Plaid is already starting to see take shape in the United States where many of Plaid's customers being FinTech providers, um, we actually see consumers asking for access to their FinTech data quite similarly as they do to their banking data. So this idea of data reciprocity would imply that it wouldn't only uh, require banks to make the data accessible, but also fintechs. And I think that's a really strong foundation um, for, for this system. And, and Richard, I think you, you've hit the nail on the head here, right? Like what we're all aspiring towards um, and what ultimately will set this ecosystem up for success is over the next one to two years, you know, one, in the context of open banking narrowly, will we get this open banking lead from the finance department who will carry forward the vision of the advisory committee recommendations where a consumer sits at the center with access to their data? And then at the bigger level, as Vast discussed with up modernizing privacy regulations, you know, Quebec has passed a privacy rule that in 2024 will establish a right to data portability for the first time in Canada, you know, how will the federal government react uh, over the next year or so? These are issues that we as policy wonks and we hope the attendees of this panel will really carry out there in, into the, the public forum as, as advocates um, on consumers' behalf. Any other thoughts on the, um, the role of the data right? Uh, I see we have one more question, which is, do you think Canada is rushing to catch up with other markets? A couple of questions, actually. Should we allow real-time rail to pro proliferate, to unlock value, and then work on open banking? Just a thought. I think, Alex, you mentioned sort of the parallel tracks here and, and how that's been a concept that's been around for a while. Um, any thoughts, Hannah or Vass, on the rushing concept? Definitely not rushing anywhere. <laughs> Yeah, if I had to wager, I would say the, the government has been too busy to wrap its mind around uh, the advisory committee's recommendations. Uh, and if you pressed it, it would say, you know, we need some time to absorb this, figure out what we're going to do. Um, and, and that actually is one of the reasons why 
it's good that the government is looking to appoint a person to take this off the government's plate because for the government, it really is not a priority. Yeah, I mean, it could also be really hard for someone newish to parachute into this and, you know, not have been, I mean, I'm sure they're going to be, have been a part of, of past engagements in some way. You know, back to the rushing, it's like, we should rush as policymakers. We should move quickly. We should pilot. We should iterate. Um, I think I just want to point back to that, you know, impatience, but also inertia. This is a big decision and we want to get it right. And that does take time, but it can't take forever. Um, so maybe the, the public pressure is going to come through impatience or getting bored talking about open banking, uh, as I imagine, you know, people close to the ecosystem may be, uh, but yeah, there's still more work to be done and, uh, more stories to be told and conversations to be had. And smart regulation can be a competitive advantage for Canada. I was talking to an American friend who works in, in, in public policy advocacy, and they were saying that, you know, for, for a lot of tech companies, Canada is something like a 51st state. The U.S. can pile stupid regulation on after stupid regulation, but a lot of tech companies are still going to want to go to the U.S. because they can access a customer base of over 300 million and, and, and get access to one of the most liquid capital markets on earth. Stupid regulation be damned. Um, Canada is already sort of at a bit of a disadvantage. Uh, why are we making it harder by lagging on what is a really sensible approach to financial sector policy? Great points for us to, to end on. And just one more plug again for Alex and Vass uh, moving forward with their research proposal. With just a minute left here, um, any thoughts, any closing thoughts, and, and in particular, the question I Gave folks a couple of minutes to think about any any songs. What what should be our playlist uh, for open banking in Canada? I'll go first. Uh, number one song of all time, according to Rolling Stones, uh, recent 500 greatest songs of all time, Respect by Aretha Franklin. I think we've all worked very, very hard to bring this new innovative ecosystem um, into a world of, of respectability and desirability as, as it deserves. You know, folks want to play and participate in this space to, re to respect consumers and their needs. Um, so that would be my vote. Uh, Alex, Hannah, any, any other contributions? Yeah, uh, if I can be ridiculous, I would say, I think, um, Raining Blood by Slayer, because the fight behind the scenes is not going to be uh, very clean. It's going to be messy. Uh, mine is uh, Nine Nine Problems by Jay Z. I'll take uh, Jacob's suggestion in the chat. One of our MPP students, Bank Robber by The Clash, to round out. Okay, well, keep an eye out for the playlist uh, to come alongside uh, the recording of this webinar. So, thanks again so much, everyone, for joining. Thanks to our wonderful panel, who I'm sure we will continue to hear from in the public forum, uh, with open banking continuing to move forward in Canada in the coming years. Thanks everyone so much. Thanks for having us. Thanks.